your head was a clown. Yeah, yeah but you don't lose up, the control. Who wants to front it out? Who wants to play the big man? You. Like he's a duds in front of his people then. And then offer people out. I just wasn't in the mood to kind of deal with it. But it's wrong. I should have stayed on this end of the barrier. I should have let him continue mouthing off. You know what I mean? So I take responsibility for jumping over and getting involved in it. Yeah, you need to move. You, need, you are doing this for a long time. Let him speak, man. Let him speak. But at the same time, you heard me before I opened up. I said, everyone has the right to their opinion. But he's picking up the fight. And I have got no problem with his point of view. No. But when a man threatens me with violence, come down, yeah. that's another thing. So do you know what I mean? Yeah. I've had to deal with that all my fucking life from white people. Do you understand? My first case when I was a youth was seven years old, eight years old, when I'm stopped by the police wearing a silver ring. Do you understand? Under the sus laws. They criminalized me when I was a fucking intelligent youth. They made me a fucking villain. Do you understand me? Rather than go and get my fucking education, these people criminalise me every time I walk down the fucking streets. My brother spent seven years in the American military. He's a quiet fucking person. But I wouldn't melt in his fucking mouth. But he was stitched up by the fucking police in this country. And as a, as a record, as a result of that. Sorry, he was given a conditional discharge because of that. Stitch up, stitch up, stitch up. Things have changed a little bit. Carnaby Street, walking down there to buy a pair of fucking spectacles. Minding my own business during the 80s, when John Lennon was all out, and the little Lennon spectacles were the rage. <laughs> I went down Carnaby Street to buy some spectacles. And I see a crew of about 20 fucking, 20, 20 odd white skinheads, making monkey noises. <laughs> I can't even make it, they did it so fucking good. I was with one black friend, and two white friends. They chased us up the road, dashing bottles and all bits and pieces that they could after us. I went into the shop, bought what I needed to buy it when we ran up the top of the road. I said, I'm going back the same way I fucking come. My white friend said, nah, you're sure looking for trouble. I ain't looking for trouble, but I ain't gonna be a fucking prisoner on the road. I'm gonna walk wherever I wanna fucking walk. So then, I walked back, my white friend said, you're not coming with me. The black friend of mine, William Ali, a Nigerian brother, was my best friend. He said, I can't leave you. Got to go back with you. Went into an alley, broke a bottle. My plan was to cut the first one in the throat when he comes. I ain't going to stay and fight 20 of them. Just cut the first one, cut his throat and go about the business. I had a bottle in my jacket pocket and a, and a stick, a, a broken chair leg that I found in an alley. And I'm walking back past him. <coughs> and they're like, what the fuck? Who the fuck these cocky bastards think they are? They jump up, one of them shout, he's got a bottle, he's got a bottle. I start here, bottles breaking, kishing, kishing, kishing. So I had to drop my bottle, yank out my, my stick, because it was hindering me from running, and I ran up the road towards Oxford Street. Imagine, this is fucking Oxford Street, Carnaby Street, Central London, this shit's happening. Not fucking Eltham, do you understand? Not the fucking suburbs, this is fucking Central London. That's amazing. As I'm walking, as I'm running up the road, I made sure that a couple of them start straggling back and stopping. About, I got about five of them on my case. The ringleader had sideburns. So what I did is make him catch up a little bit. And then I turn around and run back towards him, where he's got to ease up because I've got my stick, and clobbered him on his fucking head. <laughs> I've done two or three of them, and then I'm arrested by the police. I'm arrested. I'm 17 years old. That's the first fucking time I'm in court. You understand? For defending myself. Against 20 fucking skinheads? You know what I'm saying? I'm in court. Do you understand? You've got to deal with this shit day in, day out. It's still going on. I can go on and on and on about shit that I've received yeah, from yeah. these bullshit people. And I could read his language. I heard exactly where he was coming from. You could hear it if you're black. Many of you might not see the subtleties in what he was saying. It's on here. But if you fucking know the fucking language, racism isn't you black bastard. Racism isn't a smile, a smirk. The raising of an eyebrow, a facial expression, the silent body language. I'm a fucking linguist in racism. I read the fucking language that this shit was coming up with. Do you understand? So many of you might not see the subtleties in what it is. But if you don't fucking defend it, that motherfucker's gonna go about the business doing his shit again. And now you wanna come and tell me about, oh, I'm related to the Adamses. Who gives a fuck? 
Who gives a fuck who the fuck you're related to? Do you understand? I ain't afraid of no fucking clown. I told I was a dead man years ago. That's why I went off to Sierra fucking Leon during the war. Do you understand? I've been in enough fucking conflicts as in enough motherfuckers been killed. I've done a bit my fucking self to, do, to know what I'm dealing with. So I ain't afraid of no fucking clown. Send who the fuck you want to send. I live at 19... I'm in my house generally in the evenings after five of fucking clock. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't afraid of no fucking clown, and there's no bravado, there's no heroism, but we can't keep fucking running. Black people, non-white people, and white people too in this country, have fought fucking hard to get us where we are today. I'm proud to say I live in England. I'm proud to say I live in England. Why? Because it's better to be black and non-white living in England than it is to be fucking black or non-white living in France, yes. Spain, yes. Italy, yes. Portugal, Greece, Germany. Yes. So this country has fought for where it's at today, yes. not just from the blood, sweat and tears of black people, but of white people who saw the injustice of prejudice, saw the injustice of racism. And if you don't stand up and confront it when it rears its head, then it will continue to manifest itself. True. I don't think the dialogue of racism is discussed enough. If we want to confront racism, look at how the West dealt with this Islamic extremism. What Islamic extremism? Islamic extremism is a result of Western foreign policy. But when the West were hyped about Islamic extremism, what did they do? All the news programs, all the current affairs programs, all the talk shows, question time, dispatches, panorama, discussed the issue of Islam and Islamic extremism. They debated the issue. So people had some understanding of Wahhabism and all these other different bits and pieces. Yet when it comes to racism, we even had the Queen go out on the balcony and talk about we must stand strong. When the fuck has the bitch ever stood on the balcony and said we must fight racism? When the fuck Arun? Oh, we now. These are old soldiers. Arun. This man's been fighting here from the 60s. He gave me my first job in publishing. He ran the Muslim Chronicle. Arun Jalahan. A man who knew Muhammad Ali. A man who traveled me, produced a book in the 80s. Two beloved revolutionary sons of Islam. With Omar Mokhtar and Gaddafi. 1986, Arun Jalahan. Thank you very much, brother. We were still in the front. And look at how we shift the goalposts in terms of racism. They never debate it, never discuss it. In the 70s when I was growing up, we were all black. Asians were black. Even the Irish were black. 70s black was a political term of those people who are oppressed. And then in the late 70s, come early 80s, Asians are Asians, they're no longer black. The Irish have always been the Irish. They're no longer black. And then we have this black Republican guard determining that this is what black is. And then we move away from that. And then we say we were colored. West Indian, Caribbean, African, and African, Caribbean. We have all of these sub-definitions where we run around trying to find out who we are. And let me just say this. I was a black radical. I came up through the schools of the National Black Caucus yes. and other national black organizations. Yes, yes. That was it. Grassroots, Nation of Islam. I was a black radical. And then my views became more global. And I could see the world for what it is. We are all the same people trying to coexist in a difficult world. And I'm saying, let it be a message and let it be a warning that we cannot build these trenches and say, I'm black and I'm fighting against the white man. Or white people saying we're going to dominate the world. We are all the same people trying to coexist. And the best thing we can do is educate ourselves 
about different cultures. Hold on, my friend, I'm going to get to you right now. I want to tell you a story about when I was in India. When I was in India in the 90s, biking around on an end field, I bumped into this white guy who'd also been traveling around the world and was out in India for a long, for a while. We hung out together, ate dinner together, chilled out together, raved together, did a few things together. On the last night before he was due to go back to England, we went for dinner and he broke down crying in hysterical tears. I was like, what the fuck? I know my company is great. <laughs> What's all this about? And he said, I've got to confess. I've got to make a confession to you. I said, what's up? He said, I'm a racist. He said, I'm a part of a racist organization in England. I've attacked Asians and black people. I've been a part of this black oh, this organization for years. I said, well, that's how it is. He said that traveling had been the best education that he'd received. He now sees the world differently. And why he was crying was not because my company was so great, but the world that he'd lived in before, he had to return to. And how could he return to that world when most of his friends and family shared a belief that he didn't? So we're not fighting about black or white. We're fighting about an ideology. We're fighting about an ideological cancer which eats through our minds, which makes us form prejudices against others. Over the last 10 or so, 15 years, we've seen an influx of Eastern Europeans, Poles and others come to Britain. And I have heard some of the most disgusting, disturbing comments about these Eastern Europeans from black people. From black people who experienced the very same racism when they arrived in this country, now replicating the very same racism that they received against Eastern Europeans. It is the cancer of racism. And many of us black people say, oh, black people can't be racist. We don't have the finance to be racist. Of course, Alicia. racism is mired in, ca in capitalism. But the cancer of racism can affect us all. The cancer of prejudice can affect us all. You'll see.